Okay. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. Um, I am Sudhir Prasad. I'm Product Management Director for Container Storage at Red Hat. I have with me Annette uh, Kluet. She is Senior Software Architect, uh, very well versed in Kubernetes and storage. She will lead the demo for us. We also have uh, Michael Adam, who is heading the uh, uh, manager and lead for CNS engineering, Jose and Erin, who actively contribute on and developer in the CNS world. So if you guys have any deeper question, they will definitely be staying here for uh, after the session to talk about it. So I think most of you guys are familiar about Kubernetes and how you can run your stateful applications with it, right? Um, today we'll go and see that, you know, can we run the storage on the Kubernetes platform, right? Why we are treating that differently? Um, can it be treated as any other um, service and become a part of the platform? So if you look at the persistent storage, right, and I categorize them in, in three broad categories. The first one is basically the platform infrastructure needs, right? It's registry, logging, metrics, and if you have other management applications, things like that, right? This is basically persistent storage needs for running the infrastructure, running the Kubernetes platform itself. And the second one is your application persistent needs, the data, you know, input data, what you need, or the results of the analytics and things like that. And the last one is mostly a local storage or ephemeral storage. And traditionally for persistent storage, we have focused on the first two one of them, right? Can we run the platform? Can the application get persistent storage? There is some work going on to really make the local storage also persistent. That's not yet there, but you know, it will be there shortly. Um, so there are various solutions for persistent storage. And you know, anyone and every storage company have some persistent storage for container. And extremely confusing, right? You know, um, and I'm sure they all have unique value proposition into them, right? You know, something, some of the applications do better for some specific application. And some of them do good for some infrastructure needs, right? What we'll discuss here is that what is the design pattern they are following? and what's the trend, and what are the advantages, what advantage at a general broad category. <clears throat> the first one is very simple, right? This is how everything started. That, you know, Kubernetes came as a platform, people wrote their driver or plugin, and then they have a legacy storage or existing storage, or the storage from the cloud provider, and then Kubernetes platform, the containers can get the persistent volume from the platform. The key to note here is that you know we, you already had the storage, it's a separate independent subsystem, and you're trying to make that work for your containers. Right? That's the biggest advantage, that you have the storage, you can leverage it, you can focus on the new platform. But the disadvantage of this approach is, <clears throat> you know, it's still a different subsystem, it's not part of your platform. You can definitely use it, but it's not you're not taking advantage of the newer paradigm with your storage subsystem. The second paradigm is basically, you know, uh, let me talk about this one a little bit. You may have heard about CSI interface, right? That, you know, these plugin, you know, then there are different orchestration engines, you know, and these plugins doesn't work um, interchangeably between them. Then it's like, let's make it a standard, and this is the CSI initiative that, hey, all these drivers should be talking through one interface so you can use Kubernetes, you can use Mesosphere, and things like that. But the general principle stays same, that hey, I want to create a plugin with my existing storage subsystem, or my storage subsystem, a newer one, and then make it work. The second one is basically, can we make it API driven? We don't really need storage admin to really give developers the storage every time they need it, right? So this one is basically, you know, how we can publicize an API, through service broker or a service, you know, where developers can go and then get their own storage. As long as admin has given them the privilege or the quota, they can, through the APIs, they can go and access the storage and, and um, do their work without you know, asking the storage admin for you know, any storage. Key thing here is that though it's API driven, it's still a different subsystem. You know, you can manage them as a different subsystem, but they can interconnect using a more automated way. 
The third one is much more interesting, and this is where we will do deep dive and do a live demo of that one, right? Can we merge storage subsystem as make it as invisible, but an integral part of the Kubernetes platform itself? Here you run the storage on top of Kubernetes platform. You have multiple nodes, you know, like one cluster. Some of the nodes, just like it's hosting an application, it's also hosting your storage service. Right? So in this paradigm, right, you have basically one cluster. You know, storage is just like any other service. Just like you have router service, you have a storage service. It's managed and, and basically maintained by Kubernetes platform itself. I'll go a little bit deeper here. So you have multiple a Kubernetes cluster, you have multiple pods. One of these pods will be running your storage node, right? And here I've taken an example of a Red Hat container native storage. And I'm more familiar with that because I'm product manager for that. <laughs> um, so you will have different nodes, you know, depending on how many, how much scale you need. You have multiple pods, you know, or multiple nodes of the clusters. But the key is that just like your application is running on top of Kubernetes platform, you have a storage running on top of Kubernetes platform, right? You get many advantages with that, right? Because you are taking the full advantage of Kubernetes orchestration itself. It will maintain this state, it will scale it just like it can scale other applications. You have one control plane, one management plane. And though storage is a little bit special because attached to the data and it's a little bit heavier, but you know, it will be kind of integral part of the platform. Because you're running on top of the Kubernetes platform, right? It can run anywhere, wherever Kubernetes runs. So it can run on the private cloud, public cloud, virtual, bare metal, hybrid, whatever you take, right? That's the advantage of taking full leverage of the platform itself. So if you can run Kubernetes on any, any infrastructure, then the storage can run there. The other advantage you get is that since you are running as a container, right? Container itself has its own value proposition. Right? Imagine deploying a storage as a standalone appliance. It always takes some time, effort. Here you can do that in minutes, right? Because it's just another container. You can deploy that, upgrade that. It has full isolation. You can do rolling upgrade, things like that, right? Some customers also has done co-location of the storage nodes and the application nodes, you know, for various reasons. You can do that, right? Because it just you can put them in the same pod, you can do them in different pods in the same host. Um, I'll summarize this one. This approach is basically, you know, how we can take the whole platform, make the storage as integral part of the platform itself, run it on top of the platform, make it invisible, though it's a little bit special, no doubt, but Let's exploit the full potential of Kubernetes, full potential of container, and then, you know, of course, the software-defined approach, what you get with it. We'll do a demo of the Red Hat Container Native Storage. Annette, want to take over? Yep. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Sudhir. Um, yeah, I, I want to uh, sort of go first through the demo that we're go I'm going to do, and then I'll actually do it. It, it will be a live demo. It might look a. Uh, I've, I've set it up so that it can't go wrong, right? But um, <laughs> but um, you'll be able to see it, and it's it's pretty cool. So um, let me just move on here. So we are going to go through what. Um, Sadir called the the uh, pattern where we're actually using the platform for the storage. The the storage, at, at some from Kubernetes' point of view, is just another workload, um, which you know makes it pretty pretty good because at that point you know OpenShift or or Kubernetes. I'm just to be clear, I'm going to be using uh, an OpenShift environment um, to to show this, but. It, it is a workload and it, it has all the advantages of being on the, the platform. I want to um, just sort of make it simple and clear that there's, there's no magic here. Um, we still need real storage somewhere. <laughs> and um, the storage that we're going to consume is connected to the uh, OpenShift nodes or the Kubernetes nodes 
that we want to create the cluster, the storage cluster with. That storage can be all of the storage types that you can put into a, a piece of hardware. It could be SSDs, it could be um, H, you know, hard disks, it could be uh, NVMEs, I mean, it could be whatever storage. The main thing is that for each cluster that you create, and this is a cluster cluster, you want to use similar storage. Um, so it's conceivable that I could offer to, to the developers for dynamic provisioning, I could offer a, a fast cluster. Th think of like AWS, right? I could have a cluster made of IO1 uh, EBS volumes, and I could have another cluster made of, um, you know, GPT, GP2 or, or a slower storage type. And I could offer that, and then, you know, based on their, their rights, they could make decisions about which, which uh, storage they want to use. The, the other thing to just point out on here is that this is a, a simple architecture, a simple cluster architecture called Replica 3. Um, it does require that there are three OpenShift nodes involved, uh, or Kubernetes nodes. There's, you need to have three. At this point in time, you can only have one of the um, storage containers on each node. So that, that's why we need three. If I wanted a second cluster, which is shown here, with the, um, I don't know if I can get it from here, it doesn't look right. But anyway, the, the, the fast and the slow, that, that would take six um, nodes to, to deploy that. So the, the demo that I'm gonna do here, so I mean, I've, I've been watching a lot of demos this week and, they're, and they're, they're good, but sometimes you can get a little lost in the CLI. So I'm gonna do a demo that's gonna be CLI, but I wanted to, um, give you some context before that. So my, um, my uh, Kubernetes OpenShift environment here has a master node, it has an infra node. The infra node houses the, uh, the registry, the router, and then I have three app nodes. And those app nodes are where I'm gonna deploy the CNS. There will be, you'll see, you're gonna see there's gonna be cluster pods, and then very important um, for the service that, that uh, Sadir discussed is the Haketi API. So there will be a pod um, that Haketi runs in. It, the the Haketi pod is not tied to any one node, and that's very useful because if the Haketi, if the node that the Haketi pod is down, goes down, the Haketi pod will recreate itself on another um, available node, and it will remount its database. So. We see here, um, just pointing out that these, you know, this is how we're gonna create the cluster. Um, we're gonna deploy pods onto the, to the three app nodes. In terms of, of Haketi, um, what makes this, I think, a really uh, useful uh, approach is that at the developer view, they just see the, the ability to create dynamic storage, and they do that uh, via something called a storage class resource. And this, this storage class is really the glue between OpenShift and, and the storage provisioning. You see in there um, that the provisioner is Gluster FS. So Kubernetes has uh, that provisioner. And you also see that there is a route there. That is the Haketi, that is the route to the Haketi service. You also see a cluster ID. That is a, a Haketi ID to uniquely identify the cluster. So if I wanted to have different storage tiers, um, fast, slow, that uniquely identifies that cluster. And then we want to absolutely secure the, uh, the API because you know, we don't want people coming in uh, and, and just creating you know, uh, PVs, persistent volumes on our storage. So we secure it via, again, an, an OpenShift resource called a secret and um, that, that makes up the storage class. This, again, is, is completely a, a Kubernetes OpenShift uh, resource, and we're gonna use it. To the left there, you just see that, you know, Haketi is in the middle. Uh, when, when OpenShift calls in for a new, uh, a new persistent volume, it goes through Haketi. When I delete that project, it's deleted uh, with the project, and Haketi does that work too. We'll also see that Haketi is really useful for inspection, as well as day two activities, um, all of your day two, uh, adding more storage, 
um, adding more to clusters, all of that is done via the Haketi CLI. And this, I think pretty much we've already gone through this, but um, just to, to reiterate, um, you know, it's three, three OpenShift or three Kubernetes nodes per cluster are required because of the replica three. So the life cycle, um, I, I, again, I'm going through these slides so you know what's happening when I do the demo, but the life cycle of this is a developer via a, a template um, that let's say they want to create, I don't know, MySQL Postgres application in the template. They're going to uh, re request a, a uh, persistent volume. And in that persistent volume request, there will be the defined storage class. So that's really, again, that's just the glue, is I want a persistent volume from this storage class of a particular size. That's submitted via the storage class uh, and the Haketi route to the, to the storage back end. It goes through Haketi. Haketi uh, goes into Gluster, provisions the volume, comes back up, and then um, that is mounted to whatever the mount point was in the template. So, Let's get into the demo. Any just burning questions before I get started here? I don't know how much time. I should have a little bit of time afterwards if you have some questions. Okay. So um, the first thing we have there, I didn't know it was going to the bottom of the screen, but that's okay. Um, so in, in OpenShift world, instead of using um, kubelet or cube, con, cube control or cube, so, so, anyway, instead of using that, you use OC. <laughs> See, that's how often I've used the other one. <laughs> so OC is essentially equal to that. So I say, you know, what, what do I have? So I've, I have already, I did this a couple hours ago, created an OpenShift here. And um, we have the M for the master, and then we have the three nodes. So the first thing I need to do, or I can do, I can put it in a different uh, namespace or a, a namespace that exists, but in this case, just to make it clean, I'm gonna create a new namespace um, for my deployment, and I call it container native storage. And now the, the, the one thing I do need to do, um, we're gonna see that the, the Gluster pods are going to uh, use the host networking so we need to give the, um, the daemon set um, privileged access. So that's done via that. And then I just wanna show you um, quickly here. So this is the topology file. I'm sort of starting from the bottom, but um, if we look here, this is a node. So we, we put in the node, we put in the IP address, that IP address actually is equal to the host, so the, the hosts are, are gonna have the same. And um, I mean, the, the Gluster pod, when it's created, is gonna have that, that IP, and then we give it the devices. Important thing on the devices, in this case, um, this is actually on AWS, so this is an EBS volume, but um, you, can, you can put as many storage devices, just comma separated, as you want in there. There's reasons that, um, let's say you wanted one terabyte for your cluster, you may want to do it in 250 gigabyte chunks so that you know, if you need more storage and you need to add more storage to your cluster, um, you just add another 250 gigabytes. So it's, it, it is useful, it's not technically required to, to have the storage, well, it absolutely has to be the same storage, but to have it also the same size. So all of these are, in, in this case, only 50 gigabytes. So let's continue here. So we're actually gonna do the deployment now, and, and I should have mentioned it, but that uh, topology.json is, um, is, a, is a Haketi uh, <coughs> requirement. So that, that it, Haketi uses that to um, create the cluster. So going into some UI here. Um, so here's my new project. And I'll start to see the, uh, the Gluster pods coming up here. Um, again, there, there will be, end up, there'll be one on each one of the, the node zero, one, two, three that I showed you. 
and they're starting to come up. Once they are um, available, then we'll, it'll go on to the Haketi deployment. And um, I don't, I, I, I'll just mention it because I, I don't want to go back and forth too much, but remember on the slide, I showed you, um, you know, the Haketi route. And when, when we get done with the, the uh, deployment here, we'll actually, it, it will automatically create that route that we're going to use in our storage class. So let's see how we're doing here. Got one up. <laughs> um, so it, it, it should go pretty quick. Let me just, yeah, there we go. So now we've, we've finished, the, um, we finished the, the Gluster Pod deployment, and now we're going to do an interim um, pod called the Deploy Haketi that will be used to create the, uh, the, the final Haketi service. Um, you know, this, this does take a little bit of time, but when you, when you think about what it's going to do here, and, and this CNS deploy is a, um, a Red Hat script. It's, it's essentially just a, a very large script, but this, this is um, very useful. And I just wanted to mention, today we're just going to be looking at file volumes of the type, uh, volumes of the type file. Um, the, the latest uh, CNS images or what we call CNS, but essentially Gluster images that, that can be uh, used on Haketi also support uh, iSCSI targets as well as uh, the S3 API. So, um, you know, it, we, we started with a file because that, that is the most sort of commonly used. So we're ready to create and provide Gluster volumes. Let me just quickly go back here and show you what we have now. Um, uh, it looks like it's still killing off one of them here. But um, I just want to point out this route here. Okay, so that's the, the route. And it didn't paginate really well because um, it's just a little too big. Uh, but you can see that now when I do the, the pods, you can see that I've got three Gluster pods and a, a Haketi pod. And if you look at it, each one of the Gluster pods is on a, this is the IP address that was in the topology JSON file. So to, to create our storage class, we need the Haketi route. So we're going to use that. Um, and that is created as a combination of the namespace and the domain name. We're also, um, this is sort of, this is just gonna just show you one of the Haketi. This one is a little um, busy, but um, what we have here is that we can actually see, we can see that this is our cluster that we just created. We can see that we actually have one new volume. This is the Haketi DB storage. The Haketi DB storage is how the PVs are kept track of. And like I said, if, 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 the node that Haketi is on, the Haketi pod, it will recreate itself on a new availability zone or a new, a new machine, and it will remount this. So uh, in this situation, the Haketi, it, you know, you'd be headless during the time it was being recreated. You couldn't create or delete any PVs, but as soon as Haketi came back up and, and remounted this, you'd be good to go again. So um, the other thing we see here we see that we already have our three nodes, and we see that uh, we've used two, two gigabytes of our total of 49. So very important, um, I just want to show you what the JSON looks like or the YAML looks like for the secret. That key um, is, I, I, I didn't point it out, but when we did CNS deploy, we gave it a, an option called admin key so we set that password, and this is the Base64 um, encoding of that password. So we're going to go ahead and um, we're going to create that resource. This is an OpenShift resource. So now we have a CNS secret. We also need our cluster ID for our storage class, so that's our cluster ID. Again, this is a Keddy CLI command. Um, very useful uh, for, for listing what you have. 
And this is our storage class. Um, we, I showed you an example, but this is, a, this is you know, the example for this deployment. So we have our route, we have our cluster ID. If, it, if you were doing this, you would have had to copy that cluster ID and put it in, but this is, you know, I, I, uh, it's, it, I did it so that it's already there so we don't have to do that. And we have the CNS secret, so we're, we're ready to go on that. So we're gonna go again and create that resource. That resource is again uh, a Kubernetes OpenShift resource, uh, storage class name. Just one thing on the storage class name, um, e even if you're doing evaluations, maybe it's just me, but try, try to do uh, storage class names that explain what it is. So like if you're AWS, you know, maybe put GP2 into the storage class name. <laughs> uh, if you just put, you know, Gluster, that doesn't, uh, doesn't say much about what kind of storage it is. So we now, and, and the other thing I didn't point out when, when we were looking at it is that there's an annotation in the storage class that you can add that will make that the default storage class. What that means is that if I am in my template, um, you'll see that, that the template I'm gonna show you, I do have it, uh, I do have the annotation in there, but you don't need it if you have a default storage class. You can only have one default storage class per, per um, OpenShift or, or Kubernetes uh, instance. So if you add another cluster, it would, you know, it would not be default and you would have to specify the name. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go ahead and, and use, um, we're gonna use this storage class and, and create um, some storage for a MySQL deployment. So I, I created a, a namespace. Um, Right now, in that namespace, I'm just gonna get it ready so we can watch it. Um, there's nothing in it right now. So um, we're going to deploy it via the template. So let me just show you where it shows up in the template. So all we have to do as a developer now is to include this in our template. And in our case, because I have a default storage class, you wouldn't even have to put this annotation in here. I think it's sort of good practice because it's pretty easy to change a storage class to not be default for some reason, so at least you have it. Um, the other thing we have is a read write once. Important concept is that um, the Gluster file volumes support read write many. Uh, you know, you could have pods writing to, to one file on a, a read-write mini. This is a read-write once because it's a database. But um, the, the access modes are, are read-write uh, once, read-write mini. And there, there's another one that's, uh, that I don't remember right now that's not used very often. But you, you do specify that. And then very importantly, you specify the size. Uh, you can, via in day two activities or, or day two um, task, you know, you keep track of the usage on the volume. Um, via Haketi, you can expand that volume. Okay, so let's go ahead and create this now using our, our so we see that there's some resources now. We're creating the secret. This is all in the template. We're creating the service. We're creating a persistent volume claim, and we're creating the deployment. If we go back to, um, to um, here, we start to see the, the uh, deployment. And if we go to the storage, we see that we already have our PV. I, I, it might be sort of small. Um, I'll show it to you a different way I can show you in CLI. But it's already been um, claimed via the, the CNS Gold storage class, and it's ready to be used. Go back to our pods. So it looks like that we're still sort of uh, running this. Usually the MySQL deployment goes pretty quick. I just, I, I want to show the, um, so if we hit return here, um, you see that I can see that my PV is bound. And again, it tells me, um, it tells me the name of the PVC. So in, in OpenShift uh, or, or Kubernetes resources, you have a PV resource and you have a, a PVC resource. This is a PVC resource that we just created, but it automatically creates the PV. 
And what's cool about that is when you delete the PVC, the PV is gone too. It's not hanging out, it's completely gone. It's not, you know, so I know in some cases, like something like NFS or something, it sort of hangs around and you have to manually do it. Not, not true with, with this. So our MySQL deployment is done. Um, and we should be able to see that here. Uh, yeah, so it's going. So let's go ahead and um, see what we have here. So we're going to log into it via the um, RSH command. And what I see, and again, it's not paginating great, but um, I see here that I have a volume name, and it's mounted to my MySQL data directory. If I then um, get a little, uh, now what I want to do, so I want to track this volume that I see mounted in the pod all the way back to Gluster. So I'm going to now log in to Gluster, and, and again, we're back in our container uh, native storage project. We log into the, the first, we can log with Gluster if you've ever used Gluster. Um, you can run the, the Gluster uh, commands and this, the, the commands we're running right now would be these, I mean, Gluster, just like OpenShift has no idea about uh, Gluster, Gluster has no idea about OpenShift or Kubernetes. So this, this is exactly the same command I would run in a, a Gluster cluster that had nothing to do um, with, with what we're seeing today. So we, we see, um, we do see our Haketi volume up here at the top, the very first one a Keddy DB storage, and then we see the, the volume that we just created. We also see that there are three bricks. Um, th this is, you know, Gluster's um, terminology for the storage, and each one is on a different uh, node. So what we're gonna do now, in the last activity we're gonna do, is just get, use the Keddy again to get more detailed information about that volume. We, we get information about its volume ID, uh, cluster ID, where it's mounted, and that it's a replica three. If, if you had day two activities, all this would be important to you if you wanted to increase your storage, add more to your cluster, add another cluster. Well, actually, not add another cluster. If you add another cluster, it has a different cluster ID. But, but if you're working on the same cluster, you know, this is how you can get that information. The end. <laughs> so. Anyway, we have, uh, it looks like about three minutes. So I don't know. Um, there is any question? Yeah, questions? Yes. Yes. I, uh, I'm, I'm, do you have any more to elaborate on that, Jose? Yeah. Um, can you repeat the question? Do we, uh, Red Hat, plan on packaging this into a Helm chart? And the answer is yes. And the answer is yes. <laughs> sure. Can you guys speak to the I.O. performance of this? Like what to expect and how it compares to non uh, native storage? Yeah, I, I can speak to that. Um, we, we all this entire year have been doing um, performance benchmarking. And the, the thing you need to, I guess, be, you need to realize is we are doing Replica 3 and it's um, absolute consistency. So compared to a single write, you're writing three times, right? So, it, and that's good and bad. Um, if I'm in a, a AWS environment, say I'm across three different regions, I can tell you, because I've done the latency testing, those regions are not in the same, um, they are not in the same data center. In some cases they can have like, a millisecond of delay, which is about 20, 30 miles. Um, in that case, you know, your, your slowest ride is going to control your write speed. And in general, reads, no problem at all. But because um, a, a read is, is, is a single, it's not a, a replica three. But, but the writes, you know, you do, we have a, a maximum of five millisecond latency budget diameter between the replicas. And, and running it on top of platform versus not you know, running it aside, right? You know, running it in a standalone. Um, we see not much difference, two to five percent, depending on you know what kind of infrastructure you have. 
Yeah. So we, it's not statistically different as such. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, um, so, I, I, let me take that. So yeah. I think this, so we took the three replica route right now as a default. Um, we do have option to basically. Yeah, he, the, he was asking if you're in a very, like a single site, why do you need three replica? Why couldn't you just do one replica? So it's, um, so we took the default route right now, replica three, right? Um, we fully intend to support the other replicas right now. We're not publicizing. The challenge is that if you're running on top of the platform, we do want, um, you know, the Kubernetes can reschedule anywhere and node can go down. We wanted to protect there. So there, and then there are options like replica two plus, you know, arbiter kind of approach. So we will be, you know, making that as an option because Gluster already supports that. So we'll make that available. Yeah, and just in general, right? I mean, you're looking for high availability or storage. So if you do have a single replica and, and that replica is gone, you, you, you know, you have the pods can't come up in a different host or a different AZ. Okay. Anything? I think we're, we're, we're going to get booted out. We'll be outside if you have additional questions, including the, the CNS engineering uh, team here. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank you.